All right, everybody. This is Phil Cavano from Monster Magnet. You're watching The Heavy Galaxy Show. Rock on. All right, what's going on, everybody? Thanks again for joining me here on the Heavy Galaxy Show for another great episode. And today, I've got the absolute honor to have with me a gentleman who's been at it for almost 40 years with his legendary transcending metal trio, Prong. And they're getting ready to unleash the band's 13th studio release titled State of Emergency, which is no doubt for me, metal album of the year, hands down. I'd like to welcome oh, wow. Mr. Tommy Victor to the show. Come on. I know you've gotten out more than once on this uh, interview cycle you've been doing, I'm sure, man. It's once record. before. Once, Once before. before, yeah, that, that must be my buddy Chris Aiken, I'm sure, because we've uh, exactly we've that is yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool, man. Cool, man. Well, Tommy, yes, let's get into it, man. State of emergency. Um, prog, like I said, 13th studio release, uh, comes out October 6th on uh, Steve Hammer SPV. It's the first full length since uh, zero days back in 2017. I mean, I can't believe it's been over six years. I mean, we did get the uh, Age of Defiance EP in 2019, but you know, what's what I find interesting is that, you know, you had put out five records in six years, you know, going back to when Zero Days was released, uh, which, you know, is a, a crazy pace. That was like reminiscent of the 70s when bands were putting out, you know, records every 12 to 15, 16 months. So did you finally just say after Zero Days, OK, look, I've, I've got all these albums out in all this short time, man. Let's let's take a little time off to, you know, let the fans maybe, you know, digest all those records, considering, you know, a lot of people got this short attention span for music these days um i think it was partially that that was a lot of records for a short amount of time yeah. uh i had a manager then who was pushing me to do that mm -hmm. so uh oh, okay I, I think i got a little exhausted on mm -hmm. the other hand there was the pandemic and then mm -hmm. our record deal expired okay. so i wasn't even sure should i make any more records period uh definitely was questioning that then one thing led to the other. I had another kid and that took up some time and mm -hmm. we did a, finally did a tour at the end of the pandemic. That took some time. I still wasn't sure about doing another record. Then mm. we got, uh, we got contacted by Napalm SPV. They wanted to do another record. So we did it. We, we signed a new deal and then it was, when do you want to do the record? It's like, Hey man, I, I'm going to move. So let me do that when we finish the move. So we moved back to New York, and then that's when I started do, doing it. So I had uh, a good amount of time to settle in and mm -hmm. then prepare properly to design the record. And, and uh, I think that the planning on this record was less rushed, and uh, it just worked out great. Like the, the writing process didn't take that long neither. So it just had, was a really good period. And uh um, i'm happy way everything came about but again between you know having another child the mm -hmm. pandemic and then the move took a while and then deciding to make a record mm -hmm. and that's why it took so long sure man well i mean i know we're, we're you know we're not going to probably get five records in six years again but one thing no. we do have uh, uh, uh one thing we do have though with state of emergency man is an album i think that's no doubt going to rank right up there with the classic records from the 90s for most fans um you know and the reason why i love it so much is to me it's really the first record uh, you know that i can remember in recent times where a lot of the songs you really harken back to the the beg to differ area with that 90s groove metal era i mean the title track is really a prime example of that i mean light turns to, to black i mean who told me they all have those mid-tempo meaty you know groovy hooks and it's just so great to hear that style again, I mean, to go along with obviously, you know, how much you've now grown as a musician 
over the years since then. And like I said, that's why to me, it's definitely a top three prong record of all time. So, I mean, talk a little bit about returning to that style and the good portion of the record. I mean, was that deliberate or is that just sort of how that, you know, the nature of how it all came together once you started writing? Some of that deliberation is part of the process. It just, it's instinctual now. Uh, being the fact that I wrote everything myself on this record, I had a lot to do with it where I was pressed for time on, on zero days, for instance, and there was a couple of outside writers that I worked with. I had to, but I didn't really have to because it, I, it was, I, I think I was lazy or something because now, I mean, when sitting down and writing state of emergency, it didn't really take that much time. These risks were there. I was confident mm -hmm. about them. Uh, the, the fact that, some of it does reflect Bake to Differ uh, and Rude Awakening and Cleansing. I think it was part of the fact that I was back in New York and it was similar to how I wrote stuff way back then where I was in an apartment and just the whole, the way the sky looks and mm -hmm. the way I was feeling about everything and being close to where I grew up and the, the, the old records were still running that i listened to when i was a kid was was running through my veins a little bit more and okay. uh, mm -hmm. yeah, i think that that had something to do with it um i had a more sense of nostalgia as well mm -hmm. and uh you know it's hard to really pinpoint exactly why it's the way it is but uh you know trying to analyze what i went through during the process um that may be the easiest way to describe it was that uh, i was close to where i grew up close mm -hmm. to where i wrote those old records being back in new york uh and then just having that grit like when you hit the guitar and like you know this this feels right and uh, mm -hmm. yeah i mean it, it, my influences are what they are at this point you know like sure. sometimes i get a little bit modern uh and I'm I'm not completely unaware of of a lot of the newer bands, uh, but uh, you know, no, not many people are doing this anymore. Too, like the groove metal stuff is, you know, uh, you know. They're, they're, I mean, you you've given me a really positive review. There's been a couple other ones that are saying, "Oh, well, these guys are like, you know, the same old stuff all the time." It's like, well, who else is doing this? No one's you know? doing so, it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know. And it like, you know, somebody's got to carry the prong flag or i mean it's sure. a legacy thing anyhow if anybody cares but uh you know that that's one of the reasons too where it it's it is what it is prong is what it is uh, there are certain confines to what those riffs are and what those songs i think I, on, on this record i pretty much nailed that where um mm -hmm. you know this it's and there wasn't many there wasn't any censorship going on where uh in in past records uh you, we wrote more a, a, a big group of songs and we started cutting them. I'm mm -hmm. like, you know, I'm not doing that anymore. It's like we 10 songs were written. That's it. Take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, you just brought up, you know, being back in New York city, you know, obviously there's a track on the album back to New York city. Uh, as you say, I know you're back where you belong, um, where it all started for you in the band. And I mean, there was, you know, obviously, Back in those, you know, early to mid '90s, there was nothing like seeing you guys at the limelight, and I mean, those were just the, the heyday of prong. I mean, you guys were huge in the city. I mean, you're always just a quintessential New York band. So I think it's really, you know, uh, great to see you back in New York. And I was just gonna, I was gonna actually ask you about that, you know, in terms of how much influence on the record was from being back, you know, back home. I mean, because like you said, there's stuff uh, on, you know, especially with the song "Back to New York City." I mean, even the beginning of that song, that intro with that guitar, it reminds me a little bit of that twangy guitar, you know, measure and part that you have in Unconditional. And that's something I hadn't heard in, in, in a while in any of the records. So this obviously, like you just were talking about, it's been really, you've, you've definitely been affected writing-wise and influenced by being back in New York, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, it was a good experience. I, this, this being by myself and, and writing riffs in, in a room and... Uh, you know, with the crappy weather and et cetera, I think that has something to do with it as well. Um, it just was, it was cool. I mean, I, I really, uh, I got into the whole thing. I was, I was just more in tune to my roots and where this whole thing started. Mm -hmm. And, 
maybe the food too. Like, I, oh, yeah. yeah, I'm going to go over and <laughs> get, you know, like a couple of slices and come back and keep working or something, you know, where, you know, they do that in LA really. No, yeah, no, exactly. absolutely not. <laughs> you know, uh, I do miss the, I, I, I was way more healthier back in uh, LA. <laughs> and now I'm like, I was definitely could have put on a couple of pounds since I moved. So, but, uh, um, it's been cool, man. It's like I, yeah. I really enjoy. I, I in, in general, I mean, there this seems to be a malaise about the record. It's kind of a dark record, but in general, I, it was. I, I'm in a good mood putting it together, and it was. Uh, it was an enjoyable experience. Yeah. No. Awesome, man. Well, now you also got the legendary, legendary Steve Evans is now back in the fold on production. I know uh, Chris Collier was. You know, he did done the previous two records, but you know, Evans also did. You know, obviously, Ruining Lives and Carved in the Stone, the two ones before that. So. Talk about going to Steve for this record. Was there a specific reason why you wanted to go with him again? Basically, from the fact that he was moving at the same time I was. Like, he oh, called wow. me, goes, I'm moving back. I'm moving back to Jersey. And I'm like, what? <laughs> He's like, yeah, I bought I bought uh, Will Putney's studio, and then uh, I'm going to move in there. I'm like, well, I'm moving too. He's like, no way. I'm like, yeah. I mean, wife, my wife got a job in the city, and uh, we're moving back. So it happened at the same time. So, well, we got to do the next record together. Nice. So I was like, it was simple as that. And um, I love his new place. I mean, I think it's better than the one in L.A. So mm -hmm. uh, nice. it just worked out great. And we work really well together. We have a lot in common. Uh, we come from the same era. And uh, I, I really trust him. And uh, even my wife, even before he moved back, she was she was saying that, uh, you know, you should go back to Evans and do because Carved in the Stone is such a great record. Like, you, you should go back with him. I was like, you know what? He works you so hard. Do I really want to put myself through that torture again? Mm -hmm. And uh, I did it anyhow. Mm. So I mean, yes, he's he's a, he's he'll torture you in there, but the result is good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, to me, you know, just even from listening to the last six records, you know, that you put out since Carved Into Stone. I mean, in a way, it just doesn't even seem like it really matters who's working on the record with you, whether it's Steve or whether it was Chris. I mean, they're both obviously great, you know, studio guys because it still has your signature sound. I mean, it doesn't yeah. really seem to to really be a huge difference in terms of how this, the record sounds sonically. You know, I mean, obviously, other than, you know, I guess the engineering, you know, and then the mixing and everything. But when it really when it comes to the actual song structures and the compositions, I mean, I'm assuming that's all you, correct? I mean, any of them actually assist in that? I mean, talk a little bit about that. That's a good question. Uh, with with Collier, uh, he was involved in some of the writing, and inevitably, I would have to okay the arrangements. Like the like, sometimes the the arrangements were wacky to me. So uh, mm -hmm. that was always a struggle, and that, that that's why I say sometimes it's harder to write with other people because uh, they don't have a similar vision on uh, what the the when you, I write the lyrics, I write all the, you know, the, come up with the vocal lines. Mm -hmm. So trying to put that onto somebody else's stuff, it's, it winds up taking more time than if you did it all yourself. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, with, with, with this record, uh, we didn't really have to go back and forth. Like Steve, I, I sent them a demo and he was like, yeah, well, this stuff is cool, man. Like, I don't really, you know, we, we really didn't go through that process that much. So, yeah, mm -hmm. it's a good question. Uh, they really, uh, he, he's a good vocal, great, great vocal coach. Okay. And then uh, a, a watchdog, Chris was the same way too, a watchdog on the guitar performances. Mm -hmm. So, uh, which again, like, like you said, like I've done it so many times, like it didn't really take that long to do the, the guitar tracking on it. Mm -hmm. Um, it, 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 it just, it, it, the whole thing was pretty quick. Okay. So, nice. but the only thing difference is that, you know, we didn't like work the working hours with Evitz, which I really like and appreciate. And as we get in there and it's a longer day, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Chris sometimes would, would like to end early. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that that's was one of the things that I, I enjoyed the, what I like working and, and then, you know, the traffic in New York. So, mm -hmm. uh, I would just stay in Jersey. I wouldn't even go oh, back okay. home. Like I would just get a hotel out there okay, and just, okay. you know, you know, but, uh, it was, it was cool. I mean, we had these long days and, you know, I like that. Nice. Yeah. Well, let's talk about, I mean, you just released it on the uh, video for the first track on the record, the descent. 
uh, which is, you know, a bit more of a thrasher in the same vein as we really heard over the last, you know, five or six records. And I think it's the first video, though, that I've seen where it's just now it's just you. You know, the band now is officially really just you. I mean, over the years, I noticed, you know, you've always uh, you've always you know been uh, you always seem like a, like a team player. You know what I mean? And, you know, you've got all the other guys to band. You've, you've gone through, you know, through so many different, you know, people in the band. I know really when it comes to the writing and the recording, you know, especially I guess the rhythm parts and the drums specifically. I mean, do you direct really everything or do the, do the members have any freedom? Or is that all, all you? I mean, talk a little bit about that. Well, the members really did. It's like, who are the members? Because I yeah. have to keep changing. I got. Yeah. I mean, in, in the, since Art Cruz left to, to mm -hmm. join Lamb of God, it's just been this this hell of a process of finding a replacement for him. Mm -hmm. So we've been. It guys have been in and out, and it's just been craziness. And uh, uh, I was lucky. You know, we. You know, we got a, one of those guys. We, we was able to play drums on the record. That that's been in the band. Well, we've had a mixture of of uh, of one drummer of Jason Bittner and uh, you know Aaron Rossi and mm -hmm. Griffin McCarthy and uh, Wade Murph and Tyler Joseph. Was, these are the guys that have been playing drums in the in prong in the last couple of years. So it was mm -hmm. like, and then uh, you know Jason has not been around. So I have I've had. Uh, you know, the Christopher Dean uh, playing bass too. So it's mm. been like this wide collection of guys that whoever's available at the time when we're doing live shows and like recording. So, so Evans wind up like working, playing bass on the record. So, yeah, mm. I mean, it, it, um, yeah, he does, he does most of, he works a lot with the rhythm section and he, he gets everybody in shape on that on a lot of on some of the parts. <laughs>
Well, you know, um, what's really interesting, I always, you know, when I think of prong is that, you know, I mean, most bands, you know, when people think of, okay, what's, you know, what's the band's best records, you know, over years, most, most bands have like, you know, around two, maybe three records that fans will always say it's the band's best. Where prong, I mean, when you talk to fans, it's all over the place. And it's really tough to say which yeah. one's favorite. Because to me, I mean, I always said that there's, you know, there's four eras of the band. I mean, you obviously had the initiation of the band in the mid to late 80s with Primitive Origins EP and, and of course, Force Fed. And then, of course, you know, you had the four records on Epic, you know, Beg the Diff and Prove Your Wrong Cleansing and Root Awakening, which obviously really the pinnacle of the band's career. Then it was, of course, really that 10-year that period or so where you're kind of going through what a lot of bands go through when, you know, there's changes in musical, you know, tastes and stuff with new generations and so forth, when you had Scorpio Rising and then Power to Damage. And, of course, now the fourth era – has really been from carved to stone, you know, carved into stone until you know now. Um, and to me, that second era with those, you know, uh, the epic releases really what was interesting is each record was so different from one to the next. Whereas to me, I feel like the, over the last six records, it's been sort of the opposite, where really you, uh, it's been really consistent, and where it's sort of been like an amalgamation of the sounds and the styles that you've created over the years that you just kind of put together in one musical output on each album. I mean, would you agree with that? Is that is that something that you know again that you intentionally or deliberately try to do on a prong record? Is take all those influences and just put a little bit on of, of each record? Is that sort of something you do? Not completely. It, it just winds up being instinctually like that. Not completely purposeful. Okay. Uh, but I do agree with what you said. I mean, it's a great analysis, and you know, I compliment you on, on digging so deep on it because a lot of people don't. And uh, I think that it's because it happens naturally now when writing it, it, it's it's I like to carry all the scope, like you said, of of all of it into the new records. And mm -hmm. uh, that is important because it's, it's it's a legacy band. I mean, what, what am, mm -hmm. I mean, how much ground am I going to break? You know, like we we went through that. I've been through that and the hardships of that. Uh, when you mentioned the epic releases, it wasn't the greatest time to be experimenting with stuff. I mean. And uh, mm -hmm. being on a major label and experimenting and trying to great break, break, break ground was probably a poor decision on the band's part. And it, you're right, they all those records are different. It, it should have been where we kept to a certain standard there to like bang our sound into the people's heads when we had the opportunity to with, with the backing of a major label, but it just didn't work mm -hmm. out that way. We were always like fighting and questioning what we were doing. And, and uh, I think that if we had the support of, of an indie at that point where they'd be going, no, you would, you're on the right track. They were always like, you know, oh, you got to do this and do this, something different, like with the major label in input mm. it was like, you know, and then the stress of trying to get on the radio was a thing that was mm. a problem back then. Where mm. now I don't really worry about that at all. Like, I know we don't have the funds or, or you know, we're on, a, on, a, on an indie and they don't, they're not going to pay for the, uh, the, the radio promotion. Like, you know, if you're on a, a, a large indie in, or a major label. So that mm. doesn't come into the picture anymore. I just, I just, write a prong album and that's it mm -hmm. yeah well and you just brought up a good point i mean you, you prong is a legacy band i mean you guys have never been your quote-unquote traditional metal band i mean you always no. you always more than that and you've like you said you've always had different influences in your sound but at the same time i mean like you said you've never strayed from who you were which is how i think it makes you you know so unique at a legacy band even though like you said yeah maybe back in the you know during those epic albums yeah, you took you know some risks and chances that a lot of bands wouldn't have taken at that time. Um, but I got like a great example. Like I know uh, Dino from Fear Factory recently said, you know, with them, he said, you know, the band's unwillingness, say with them to stick to really one subgenre, really hurt the band in the long run. That's right, right. And then I, I it, you know, I just I couldn't help but think of Prong when he when he said that because you know, I mean I'm sure you're you're happy, of course, where the band is today. But I'd have to think you feel obviously somewhat the same way in regards to considering you know you never. Same thing. You guys never intentionally stuck to one subgenre as a band. I mean, that's. Well, I mean, I, I agree with Dino said, but I don't know if it really applies to him that much because they've been committed to this industrial metal thing for mm, ever since true. I can remember. So I don't know mm. what he's talking about on that, but I mm. think he's probably talking about prong really because I mean we're the ones who had to, yeah. we're the one who had to dig all these trenches for these bands, and now that's mm -hmm. I sound like I'm blowing my horn, but it's no, really right. true. Yeah. I mean, like like Fear Factory. 
you know, wouldn't exist if it wasn't for helmet, God flesh, and prong. Mm-hmm. And you know, the same I could say that, you know, with, with static X wouldn't exist w- without prong and ministry and you know, uh and it, it, the list goes on, you know, like in the whole new metal scene, uh, I don't know where it would, you know, if they would have been brave enough or the labels would have been able to uh uh, sign these bands if it wasn't for you know snap your fingers snap your neck you know so mm. uh you know this sounds like i'm bragging but i mean it's true i mean and true. you know I, I i i i'm not that happy with the where the you know where i am now because of that and mm. the fact that you know like i had to you know you know like god rest his soul like with wayne static i mean they went to the fact of like you know of really stealing our logo to that that and that much mm. was not as much and then taking so much and it's just like dude like you know like i've never seen you say one thing about prong in any interviews or everything and he got all mad at me so it's like mm. you know that that kind of stuff would always annoy the hell out of me now i'm i'm old and i'm you know i'm i'm just trying to get through life and i have a bunch of kids mm. so i don't really worry about it that much uh-huh. so it's like but um yeah, I mean that that's been the story of the band from the beginning. It's like, you know, we did all this stuff and you know, everyone was just like, What are these guys doing? And then, you know, later on bands were picking up on what we were doing and then, you know, mm-hmm. capitalizing on it. Absolutely. But you know, at the same time, I guess I know obviously, yes, it, it wasn't uh, you know, good for you know, or or you know, yeah, you it didn't obviously fill your bank account probably the way you wanted it to over the years. But at the same time, I mean, if you look at really priming, you go back to even just force fed, I mean you guys were, were, you know, when it was on In Effect Records, you guys were, you know, uh, way different than all those crossover bands and, and the hardcore bands at the time, too. You sounded nothing like, you know, uh, Cro-Mags or Leeway or Nasty Front or Carnivore. You guys were so different. I mean, so you, and you're just always a band that never, you never followed any musical trends. You were actually, as you were just saying, you were setting them for everyone else. Yeah, I mean, that's part yeah. of the greed. Yeah, I mean, huh. yeah, here we were being greedy at the same time. We're like, you know, we're putting ourselves out on the limb for some stupid reason. Like, we probably should have just stayed that way. I mean, um, you know, I mean, Beg to Differ was a success. Mm. But we, uh, we in, in total retrospect, we lost a lot of fans from that record, too. Like, we're um, mm. a lot of the whole indie metal scene were like, these guys are sellouts at that point. That's all we heard at that time. Oh, they're selling out. They, they, Beg to Differ was our sellout record at that point. So mm-hmm. who knows? I mean, there was a different time back then. Like the underground meant more uh, than it does now. And now, now mm-hmm. kids have just been, you know, brainwashed into being uh, extremely ambitious. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, that's just the way it is now. Where back then, like ambition and, uh, you know, moving away from the scene and trying to be upwardly mobile, you know, that was being was a, a yuppie, you know, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. Uh, it was looked down upon more and we were always upwardly mobile, but I don't, it, it, it was, we did it wrongly. So, uh, you know, like I look back on it and, um, you know, if I was managing a band, I'd have them be very careful uh, about doing the drastic changes that we did. Mm hmm. Well, I mean, I think a lot of it, though, too, I mean, with Beg to Differ was that, again, I, you know, like, yeah, like you said, you had a lot of those bands, the, the hardcore and the punk bands, you know, they were just happy playing CBs and that's it. That was like the pinnacle or, you know, the top of the mountain where I think, you know, it's like like most bands, you know, you got signed to a major. And I think that also made a lot of bands jealous. You know, they wanted to get that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, that was wrong because I'd be. Mean, there was all the the major indies were interested in signing prong at that time. And we should have went that mm. route because mm. Epic records was, it was, that was just, I mean, it looked good for our parents or whatever, but I mean, mm. uh, all friends and wives, but, uh, apart from that, I mean, that was another bonehead move, I think on our part. Mm. Okay. Well, I mean, you know, just, we'll, we'll get to, go back to now the state of emergency, man. I mean, you know, I just, you know, I think about, you know, like I said, it's it's one of my top three records from the band, you know, and I think about it's really, amazing, you know, right. I, it is, man, it really is. And I really think about the time during the mid 2000s where, you know, I, I myself and I think a lot of other fans really thought the band was probably done. I mean, I thought mm, I absolutely. always absolutely. Yeah, I always thought Scorpio Rising was <laughs> a great album. I think it's a great album. Okay. I think it's very underrated, you know, because it's it's real heavy. You know, what I mean, to me, along with, with cleansing, it's the two heaviest records in my book, especially vocally. Um, and look at that time. I mean, the, the, the music business was in shambles, the, the business model was broken. It still is. And not, you know, many people, I think had heard that record. And 
I remember, you know, I remember talking to you. Um, I used to, you know, see you sometimes at those New York Jet fan, you know, hangouts in LA and in the Valley and stuff. And um, I remember asking you about what you were doing with Prong. And I remember the time you, you had put up a couple of those demos uh, for some tracks that were eventually on Power the Damager. But you sounded really, I remember, doubtful about the band. And, and you something you just brought before, you were saying that you didn't think too many people even cared about the band. And if you came back, um, which to me is, is bullshit, man. I mean, a lot of people care. I know you don't have, like, you know, a fan base of, you know, one of those major metal bands from back in the day. But, I mean... If you think about like you know where especially where you guys are today, where you're at with Prong now, yeah, I mean you you have what a lot of musicians would I think love to have, and that's really one of, a, a super strong and loyal following and fan base for the fans that do love Prong. I mean they're always going to be there to support you and keep it going. I mean like I said, maybe it's not as lucrative as as you know it should be for a band who's been around as, as long as you guys have, but I would think really at this point in career, you know it's got to feel good that you at least still have that. Where a lot of bands, you know, they had their their, their, you know, spotlight or their time in the, you know, uh, doing well and back in the 90s and so forth, where now they can't, I mean, they can't sell anything. Where, I mean, Prong, you guys are, yeah, you're opening for a lot of bands, but you're also, you know, I mean, every Prong fan I know, man, is just loves what you've been doing the last, you know, 15 plus years. You know what I mean? Like, they've never strayed. And, you know, like I said, I, I know you, you think nobody cares, but trust me, there are a lot of people who do care. I mean, maybe it doesn't show, like I said, in the, uh, and the record sales, but that's just the way, you know, the business is these days anyway. I don't think you can measure success the way you used to, you know? Guys, you I really that? appreciate that. Thank you for saying that. I need to hear that, believe it or not. Yeah, it, it, compliments, yeah. It, it compliments some of the other – So, I mean, most of the reviews have been positive, but it compliments some of the things that have been said. But, uh, you know, I, I, you know I, I need to hear that because uh, – uh, you know, I mean, I really appreciate the comment, and uh, I need to hear those things because, uh, like, I, you know, I, I'm I sometimes I get uh, discouraged a little bit, but uh, you know, we've been getting, we've been doing pretty well. I mean, this the response to this record is pretty strong so far. I mean, I'm doing a lot of press. That's that's for sure. Mm -hmm. No, it's great, man. And I'm sure now being back in New York, I mean, just from from a you know a professional perspective and standpoint. I think there's no doubt you're going to have more opportunities will be there than when it was, I think, when you're out in California, just because you're so well respected and, you know, and loved in New York. I mean, I mean, I guess case in point, I mean, you, you, you did the Metallica thing in the, in the parking lot of MetLife Stadium there. I mean, I don't I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, do you think that would have happened if you were still the band was still based in, in, in L.A.? No, uh, I think, right? no, you're right, because uh, uh, they wanted, you know, two New York thrash bands mm. to do that and then um you know i guess they picked overkill and prong so i mean mm. anthrox certainly wasn't going to do that you know like mm. that's you know but uh that's we we were honored to do that it was a crazy day but we did it and it was it was a lot of fun actually mm -hmm. nice very cool man but I, I enjoy being back there i'm like yeah i mean any opportunities that was one of the things too is like is uh like trying to get guys that are based back in new york to be in the band like unfortunately mm. You know, like Jason is out and, and flying him in for all these things is impossible. He's out on the mm. West Coast. And so I got, a, you know, you know, we've had some changes. I want to get like New York based guys to do this so we could run out, do a couple of shows here and there. Like, like you know, whoever's open up, like, you know, whatever we can do locally as well. Because, um, mm. you know, I, I like staying close to home these days because, uh, like I said, I have a bunch of kids now. And stuff, sure, so. man. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I, you know, the other thing is, I remember one of the, I remember seeing you guys out here. I live in the Bay Area, and I remember seeing you. It, it, it almost, it almost pissed me off because it was at, it was at this place that was essentially a, a, a dive bar. You know, this oh, is I remember right, that little place. Yeah, you remember that little place. Yeah, and I remember just, I mean, for a fan, it was great being so close up, but I'm like, this is, this is wrong, man. There's no way a band. I mean, seeing you guys, like I said, you know, even in the Coliseum back in the day with Pantera and Sepultura right. and all that stuff. I mean, just to see you guys in a in dive bar, I remember being like. This wouldn't happen in New York City if you were, you know, playing back there. And so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure these days you don't have to worry about playing. It, hopefully, in the places like that anymore. I mean, especially being back there, I would, I would assume. And and over in Europe, obviously, where you guys are still huge too. So I think, I think the move obviously is is going to do and has done. Obviously, I think a lot of great things for the band going forward. Um, and like I said. After people hear this record, it's gonna, I think, no doubt, continue. So I mean, Tommy, go ahead. Once you, uh, what's going on now with? 
the uh you know tour now for the record i mean you know i mean i know you got the record release show uh the dingbats in, in new jersey on the uh, october 20th uh, you got some dates i saw lined up in europe you got anything else in, in store what's the plans now We're for trying tour? i mean it, i mean again like like you're getting getting a proper tour or or uh planning in america is really difficult right now so mm. uh we're trying. I mean, I, I may even not be trying as much as I probably should be, but we're, we're definitely going to do one. I just, nothing is planned right now. Hopefully it'll in the next three to four weeks, we'll, we'll get something, you know, going where uh, definitively on that end. Okay. I, I mean, you, you get a tour of the States. I mean, yeah. The, yeah. Pretty much. Okay. Yeah, we awesome. will. I mean, I was thinking of doing like a, like just like an East coast run. And thank you, woman. Then, then you know, if there's some some uh, interest, uh, flying out, and then uh, doing like a West Coast run, and uh, that would we we, we do. Mm. So if we could financially make it work, like traveling, mm. getting in a in a vehicle and going cross country with the gas prices as they are, no, and, it's crazy. Yeah, you know what I mean. And just the whole thing is just is uh, is something that I'm not really interested in doing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't play. No, right? It's just too much these days for me. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine, man. No, no doubt. Well, you know, once again, obviously the album is state of emergency. It comes out October 6th on uh steam hammer SPV. So Tommy, where should we send uh, listeners and viewers to go, you know, check out, you know, or buy the record and, and just keep up with the band. I mean, I know you got the website and everything. Is that what they should go? You can go there. <laughs> I mean, you, you can go to napalm records in America and just you know, plug in prong state of emergency at the pre-sale. You'd, is available there. Uh, merchandise is, is uh, Manic Merch, and you can find that on the Prong site too, or just go to Instagram, and we got a bunch of new stuff up there. And then uh, uh, in Europe, it, you go to spvrecords.com uh, if you want to pre order the stuff. So that's out there Napalm in America, and then uh, SPV in Europe. Okay, fantastic. Well, I got before you, I let you go, Tommy. I got two. I know you're a um, a big uh, sports fan, so I got just two little questions for you here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, obviously, do you think you think Zach can get it done with with Rogers out? What, what's what's? Oh what my god! I mean, uh, <laughs> we were hoping. I mean, I, I went to five games last year, uh, mm -hmm. and um, he is just absolutely atrocious. And the, the <laughs> fact that I have, we have to experience him again after all that we were so relieved i know and that he was i wanted him gone mm. <clears throat> i understand you know they've invested a lot in him but uh i mean the fact that we have to witness it and we witnessed it already again he i as much as there's the, the zach supporters uh, that are online give him a break give him, and this is going on three years now yeah and mm. it, it's like it, I, I can't handle it. Like I, the, my interest in the team has waned and I am spending $200 on an Aaron Rodgers Jersey for four plays. Oh, geez. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's just yeah. outrageous. Like yeah, the, the bad luck. I know and, uh, he, he was the defense does not play behind him. And that game was against Dallas was, disgusting so yeah. i don't know yeah. what's going to happen against new england i think they're going to get blown out and i think the season's over really really you don't think that defense could get i mean they got a strong defense you know it can keep they, them in games. During that, they they I, I don't i don't have any faith in rob sala i think he's okay. he's not a very good head coach neither he's not disciplining these guys he's another player's coach mm. and uh i i just you know and it's i'm a real jet fan i'm very negative <laughs> yeah well i mean it, it did well, like you said, it's 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 kind of a cursed, you know, franchise. I, I don't know what else to say. I mean, it just it's totally Murphy's low at them. Whatever can go wrong goes wrong with the Jets. I mean, that's it's just the way it's been for years, man. Second question: Are you finally gonna leave the Dodgers behind and root for the Mets? What's I going did already. I, I you already did. did that. Well, All I mean, right. under pressure of my father-in-law and my wife, really, <laughs> and that's been another. I mean, when I know it, this year, oh. I mean, yeah. it was with yeah. Diaz got hurt at world bat baseball classic i'm like they're cursed man it's the same thing man same here thing. we go again same old mets same old jets mm -hmm. it's like uh they looked promising last year but i mean scherzer was just so horrible mm -hmm. and um i was like this is just a joke man i mean i i it was 
I thought that they were going to go further last year, but uh, nope. And then uh, this year has just been an absolute, absolute travesty. And I was just reading about the Mets where, you know, Tommy Pham was came. They have he came out and said that I, he he was the it was the worst, dis, most undisciplined team he's ever seen played wow. in all these years. And he was happy to get the hell out of there. And yeah. it just shows like, you know, and I, I've been saying that about Lindor and they, these guys are like spoiled rich babies. Yeah. Already. Like, mm. you know, like they made all this money. Now they're just partying and just yep. going crazy. And that's all they care about. Yeah. I think it's just, you know, that's goes for, unfortunately, a lot of the sports. It's just these guys have just paid so much. But yeah, I agree, man. It was a disappointing year. Uh, but at least the Will Ponds are gone. I think Cohen's got at least the, the cash to keep this, you know, keep it flowing for a long time without, you know, doing another Bobby Bonilla deal or something. You know what I mean? So we'll see what happens, man. Yeah, but man. anyway, yeah. But anyway, Tommy, man, so great talking to you, man. Good luck with everything. And uh, yeah, man, we'll, uh, I think so. All right, All right man. Touch. Yeah, I will, man. Thanks, Tommy. Take Go care, Jets. bud. Go Jets. Go Jets.